I'm John Dyer V. And I'm Paula Thomas. With News Wrap, a summary of some of the news in or affecting LGBTQ communities around the world for the week ending April 17th, 2021. A young Ugandan trans man in Kenya's Kakuma refugee camp died this week from injuries he sustained in the latest attack on perceived sexual gender minorities. Critton Trinidad Jerry Atuera was among the victims when anti-queer thugs firebombed their sleeping quarters on March 15th. Many LGBTQ people have lived for years in the camp's Block 13 because of recurring anti-queer attacks by other refugees. Most fled neighboring Uganda when legislators proposed the death penalty for consensual adult gay sex. Fellow queer refugees called Atuera a proud trans man, an accomplished poet, and an admired leader. Hospital officials said he had underlying health conditions that may have made it difficult for him to survive his second-degree burns. The camp is co-managed by the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, the Kenyan government, and its Department of Refugee Affairs. According to a press release from the UN agency, Jordan Iyeshiji also sustained second-degree burns in the attack. He is recovering and is expected to be discharged soon. A High Commission official told Reuters this week that additional security will be sent to protect the camp's queer refugees. Even though Kenya punishes gay sex with up to 14 years in prison, the UN press release noted that the East African nation remains the only country in the region to provide asylum to those fleeing persecution based on sexual orientation, gender identity, or expression. Emmanuel Kiyimba is a gay Ugandan living in the camp. He told Pink News that refugees perceived to be queer are threatened or pelted with rocks or other objects on an almost daily basis. He described how many shop owners in the camp refuse to sell food or other necessities to them because they think that we will leave a curse. Kiyimba said, We never thought all would end like this. We came to Kenya seeking protection, but we are perishing. The Australian advocacy group Humanity in Need has set up a GoFundMe page to funnel financial support to Block 13 residents. The UK government LGBT advisory panel is no more. It was set up during the tenure of previous Prime Minister Theresa May to advise the government and ministers on issues and policies concerning lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people. Current PM Boris Johnson's administration has long been under fire for dragging its feet on a promised ban on conversion therapy, the medically discredited claim that queer people can be cured. Three members of the 12-member panel resigned last week over what they called the failure of Johnson's conservative government to take proactive actions in support of LGBTQ people. Queer evangelical panel member Jane Ozan blamed her departure on a hostile environment for LGBT plus people among this administration. In their resignation statements, members James Morton and Ellen Murray each cited the government's failure to advance the lives of transgender people in particular. Nancy Kelly is CEO of Britain's leading advocacy group, Stonewall. Kelly remained on the panel because, in her words, Many of the key commitments from the LGBT Action Plan initiated during the May administration remain incomplete. A government spokesperson told the BBC that a decision had already been made to disband the panel when the terms of the current members expired on March 31st. Without any specifics, they claimed that a replacement panel of some sort will be set out in due course. Attacks on the lives of transgender young their medical caretakers, and even their parents continue unabated in a number of U.S. state legislatures. Some measures either ban LGBTQ-inclusive classroom instruction or require parental consent in advance. Republican governors in Arizona and North Dakota are expected to sign those soon, and similar bills are working their way through the Republican-dominated Idaho, Montana, Missouri, and Tennessee legislatures. University of Tennessee associate psychology professor Patrick R. Zranka warned in a Tennessean op-ed that his state's bill would erase LGBT people and issues from public school curricula completely, scrubbing them from human civilization. Tennessee, along with Arkansas, Mississippi, South Dakota, and Idaho, 
already ban trans athletes from competing in school sports. Some of those restrictions cover middle and high school through college. Republican lawmakers in Alabama, Arizona, Louisiana, Florida, West Virginia, and North Dakota have also jumped on that bandwagon. Civil and queer rights groups will certainly take all of these anti-trans laws to court. The state of Texas bottoms the barrel of offensive assaults on transgender young people by Republican lawmakers. The state Senate heard testimony this week on bills that would not only deny trans young people appropriate medical care, they would also criminalize supportive parents. More on that story later. If these bills become law, that, senators, is child abuse. Wherever you hear this way out. The National Collegiate Athletic Association has thrown down the gauntlet against states that enact laws banning transgender competitors in school sports. The governors of the NCAA issued a warning this week that those states risk the loss of hosting opportunities for championship tournaments. In a press release issued on April 11th, the country's Collegiate Sports Authority affirmed that it firmly and unequivocally supports the opportunity for transgender student-athletes to compete in college sports. This commitment is grounded in our values of inclusion and fair competition. The NCAA yanked seven championship events from North Carolina after it infamously passed its 2016 anti-trans bathroom bill and prevented cities from enacting ordinances banning anti-LGBTQ bias. So the association's threat may not be empty. This week's statement noted that, when determining where championships are held, NCAA policy directs that only locations where hosts can commit to providing an environment that is safe, healthy, and free of discrimination should be selected. The ACLU's Deputy Director for Trans Justice, Chase Strangio, also warned Republican lawmakers and governors that, if you continue to pass these misguided laws, state taxpayers risk not only costly litigation, but the loss of revenue from these tournaments. Rodrigo Hang Lentinen of the National Center for Transgender Equality stressed that the harm is real and is felt very personally by transgender kids just trying to live their lives as who they really are. Ranking Australian homophobe Reverend Fred Nile announced his retirement from politics this week. The 86-year-old says he'll step down in November. Niall was first elected to the New South Wales Legislative Council in 1981 after founding the Christian Democratic Party. Its membership has dwindled considerably in recent years. Niall has been a notoriously outspoken anti-queer hate monger for decades, railing against any advance in LGBTQ equality or civil rights protections. His chosen successor is another familiar name in right-wing politics, conservative religious commentator Lyle Shelton, ex-leader of the Australian Christian Lobby. Shelton said he was honored to fill Niles' shoes, calling his mentor a courageous and often lone voice for Christ's values. Reporter Link Jenkin noted in the Sydney Star Observer that any celebration of Niles' retirement should be tempered. Don't expect him to remain entirely silent in retirement. Jenkin cautioned that Lyle Shelton could possibly be worse given that he is considerably younger than Niall and has already been at the forefront of the fight against LGBTQI plus rights and visibility for years. Finally, President Joe Biden continued to keep his promise of a diverse administration this week with the nomination of Tucson, Arizona's gay police chief Chris Magnus to lead the U.S. Customs and Border Protection Agency. Magnus began his law enforcement career in Lansing, Michigan, as a police dispatcher. He worked his way up to leading the departments in Fargo, North Dakota, and Richmond, California, before taking the helm in Tucson. He married Terrence Chung, the former chief of staff, to the mayor of Richmond in 2014. A photograph at a demonstration protesting the police shooting death of Ferguson, Missouri, African-American Michael Brown gained Magnus national prominence that year. The Richmond police chief appeared, in uniform, holding a Black Lives Matter sign. He took heat from the city's police union and other law enforcement officials around the country for that. That was also the year Richmond recorded just 11 homicides, its lowest number in decades. If the Senate confirms him, Magnus will not only be the first queer commissioner of U.S. Customs and Border Protection, he'll be leading the country's largest law enforcement agency. It's more than 60,000 agents 
guard both the southern and northern borders and the shorelines of some 320 ports of entry. The agency is also at the center of the country's intense immigration struggles. That's News Wrap, global queer news with attitude, for the week ending April 17th, 2021. Follow the news in your area and around the world. An informed community is a strong community. News Wrap is recording remotely during the COVID-19 emergency. It's written by Greg Gordon, edited by Lucia Chappelle, produced by Brian DeShazer, and brought to you by you. Help keep us in ears around the world at thiswayout.org, where you can also read the text of this newscast and much more. And you can listen to News Wrap each week by subscribing to our This Way Out radio channel on YouTube. For This Way Out, I'm Paula Thomas. Stay healthy. And I'm John Dyer V. Stay safe. <laughs>